So yeah, I want to. Um, I really want to follow on in this wonderful vein of uh, discussion and thought that we've had so far this uh, today. Uh, thinking about this question, making an old brain young. As I get older, I want to be younger. So this is part of it. But I really want to consider uh, how we can take lessons from understanding um, the child's brain and see if we can apply them to the adult brain or the aging brain or the uh, neuro, uh, the brain with neuropathology. And so, so first, before I actually do that, I, I really want to talk about um, the uh, concept of what a critical period is, and just remind you that uh, a, a developmental critical period is a period during which time uh, it, special experiences are essential for the later functioning of the brain, and that's because these experiences are essential for tuning up brain circuits, and I want to talk about that in much more detail in a minute, but a good example of a developmental critical period that I have experienced, alas, myself, is one for language learning. Obviously, you can learn throughout life. You can learn languages throughout life. But learning a language without an accent as an adult is extremely difficult, whereas, as we all know now, it's extremely easy to learn many languages perfectly as a, as a young child. And this has been my regret my whole life. Now, how, so here's the concept, basically, which is if we could only understand the underlying molecular and cellular mechanisms that regulate these developmental critical periods, maybe we could then apply them, e either in aid of repair, to reverse developmental neuropathology, or maybe even as a cognitive enhancer so I could learn French, for example, without an accent. Now, in trying to understand how this works, obviously, at the, at the level of molecules and cells, we really need to get into the brain. And uh, it's possible to do this um, in mice models. And, and in fact, uh, mice, as far as I know, have not um, been learning second or third languages. But mice, just like us, uh, have binocular vision. So here's the question. Have you ever thought about why it is you don't see double? I mean, what's happening, right, is you have two eyes, and each eye is sending a complete view of the visual world to your brain, and yet we only see one view of the world unless there's some pathology. And one of the reasons that we don't see double is because, in fact, the neural circuitry for vision brings the connections from the two eyes together in the central part of the visual pathways. And let me just show you a, a, a very simplified diagram of that now. So the point is that the output neurons from the eyes, these RGCs, the ganglion cells, send their connections to central structures like the LGN, and then beyond that from the LGN to the primary visual cortex. So vision doesn't happen Visual perception doesn't happen in your eye, it happens in your brain. And so these first few steps, you can see already how the wiring is bringing the two eyes together. So for example, uh, one of these RGCs here is sending its connection across to this LGN. Another one from the other eye is sending its connection. And already you can see that the information from the two eyes is beginning to be combined. And then at the next stage in information processing, that information is again even more combined. In fact, there's a rather beautiful, um, in this case, um, uh, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, kind of intermixing of the inputs from the two eyes. And actually, those, those intermixed inputs uh, make connections finally with these little gray circles, and these connections are uh, the target neurons that, voila, become the basis for your binocular vision. In other words, they're getting input from both the right eye and the left eye. Now, before I go further, I want to define more what I mean about connections. I'm talking about connections, but what I really mean in neuroscience terms is synapses, the synapse. What is a synapse? So let me just define a synapse. A synapse is the junction or connection 
between one neuron and the next neuron along the line, passing information, and by the way, also doing some computations as the information is passed. And in fact, you are your synapses. What I mean by that is your synapses get tuned up during developmental critical periods. And even if you are genetically identical to your sister, your twin, or whatever, in fact, your brain synapses are different because the pattern of tuning is slightly different in each case. So you are your synapses. Synapses change with learning. Memories are stored at synapses, and sadly, in Alzheimer's disease, synapses are lost. And so let's just remember that as I, as I talk further. Now, uh, what's amazing is that in animal models, it's possible to visualize synapses. So we can go down to the level of just a few microns and actually see and test synapses and understand how they work in the animal models, like in the mice or even in uh, higher, uh, higher mammals. And many years ago, this experiment was done, and it's actually possible to visualize this really beautiful left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye pattern of synapses in the visual cortex. And I just want to show you a very famous picture now from uh, David Hubel and Torsten Wiesel's lab. And at this scale, let me just point out that these, like, <laughs> these white blobs over here on the left are, uh, they're supposed to be grains of rice. So this gives you some sense of scale. Those are grains of rice. And here you see one eye, let's say the right eye, was labeled with a white tracer substance that gets all the way to the visual cortex and labels all the synapses that are functionally connected to the white right eye. And so you can see what just what I told you, that there's this beautiful right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, right eye, left eye, striping pattern. And at this scale, what you're looking at really is hundreds of thousands of these synapses at this scale, where every little dot is about the size of a synapse. Now, when neuroscientists first discovered this beautiful striping pattern, of synaptic connections, they thought it had to be hardwired. It's much too beautiful, much too reproducible to be left to chance. But in fact, it turns out that during a postnatal critical period of development, this pattern has to be tuned up. In other words, even using both eyes together for binocular vision requires an experience-dependent period. And in fact, one way that this was discovered is in trying to understand what's different between childhood cataract and cataract that you might get as an adult or your grandmother might get as an adult, where you know if you have normal vision your whole life, uh, and then you lose vision in one eye for some period of time, when the optics are corrected, then you can see again perfectly as an adult. And that's because these beautiful stripes are stable. However, during a developmental period, these stripes are not stable. They're getting tuned up. And if a child has a congenital cataract that's not corrected early on in development, then the eye that's good gets way more than its fair share of territory. So way more white synapses in the visual cortex than the bad eye gets. And the bad eye actually loses uh, synaptic connections. In fact, those connections are pruned. And uh, Jay re uh, referred to this. Um, I think several of our previous speakers talked about this idea of a period when there's a lot of synaptic remodeling and pruning going on. And that's what I want to really talk about now. So let me just summarize by saying what you see now before your eyes is a really beautiful example of synaptic plasticity. That is, the ability of a neural circuit to change its pattern of connections based on use. And this is an experience-dependent change. And in this case, it happens only during a developmental critical period in the sense that after the critical period is over, which in us is around at the age of six, these connections become stable and they can't change this dramatically uh, at later ages, which is why grandma can see even after having a cataract for a long period of time, whereas the child, if the cataract isn't fixed quite soon, uh, will be permanently blind in the eye that was not used. So this is a real use it or lose it kind of thing. So you know, let me just summarize here again by saying then that the baby's brain 
uh, just like the adolescent's brain, is not a miniature version of the adult brain. It's a dynamically changing structure. And part of the change that's happening, and we can see it in the animal models, like mice, for example, is that there's this synaptic remodeling. So synaptic plasticity is the basis for these developmental critical periods. And during this time, many immature synapses, the ones that are used get strengthened and stabilized, and the ones that are not are pruned away. So there's a kind of pruning versus a growth period. So now the question is, how in the world does this work? How is this happening? And if we could only understand it, we could restore plasticity maybe to the adult brain. But in order to do it, we really have to understand what are the underlying molecules and mechanisms that actually are responsible for this kind of pruning process. So for many, many years ago, we worked very hard to discover molecules that might be involved in pruning. And I want to tell you about one. So this molecule is a big mouthful. It's called Peer B. It's called paired immunoglobulin-like receptor B. And it's very cool that it's a receptor. The reason I emphasize that is because if you have a receptor, it can be targeted for a drug or a pill. As I said, this is like my dream, but we're not there yet. But it's good that it's a receptor. And the question is, how can we show that this molecule is actually involved in plasticity? So one way that it's possible in a mouse, anyhow, is, uh, well, first of all, I should say that this molecule is present in the brain, it's in the neurons. Happily, it's in our favorite parts of the brain that we like to study all the time, the visual cortex in the mouse and the hippocampus in the mouse. So it's there. Now, how can we actually study its function? Well, in mice, it's possible to remove that particular molecule by taking away just that gene from the whole genome of the mouse. So there are 30,000 genes or so, and one can remove just that gene and uh, from the very beginning of development, for instance. Uh, so we can make what's known as a peer B gene knockout. And we can then uh, either remove the gene from the very beginning of development, or if we're really fancy, we can take it away at any time of life. And then we can test, is this gene needed for whatever, synaptic plasticity? And the bottom line is, what we discovered is that, in fact, in these gene knockouts, uh, in fact, there is not only is the gene needed, but there's actually more synaptic plasticity than, in, than normal. And I'm happy to talk about this later, but just take my word for it, peer B is, is needed for synaptic plasticity. And so then we asked, how is this happening? What is actually going on? And you already know the answer because I told you. I told you that during the synaptic plasticity, involves both pruning and strengthening of certain connections. So we thought, let's look at pruning in these peer B uh, knockout mice. And to make a long story short, what we discovered is that pruning is deficient. And the way we did this experiment was to label some of our favorite neurons in the brain, these little green dots, with a green tracer substance. And then we could actually uh, look at very high power over here. We could look at these little protuberances, which are the sites of the synaptic inputs to these particular neurons. And then we could count them all. And when we did that experiment in normal, wild type versus pure B knockout mice, what we discovered is that there were actually way more of these connections in the knockout mice than in the wild type mice. And that actually persisted all the way into adulthood. And what we'd actually discovered is that somehow peer B is required for synaptic pruning. And in the absence of peer B, so in this knockout mouse, what we discovered is that pruning was deficient. The seesaw went in favor of synapse formation, genesis and stabilization, and away from synaptic pruning. OK, now there's a lot more one could say about this. But actually, what I really want to talk about is Boeing, a light bulb went off for us. Actually, a few light bulbs went off for us. But I want to tell you about one. Here's the light bulb. The light bulb is that in Alzheimer's disease, there's excessive synapse pruning. And this is thought to be caused, at least in part, by uh, these bad plaques and tangles that are formed by the accumulation of a substance called beta amyloid. 
which actually uh, conglomerates to make very large plaques and tangles. And it's thought that this beta amyloid is part of what's uh, responsible for loss of memory in, in uh, Alzheimer's disease. So question is, is Pier B involved? Because remember, Pier B is a pruning, is needed for pruning, and here we have too much pruning in Alzheimer's disease. So how would you study that? Well, we've studied it in a large variety of different ways, but the first way is Pier B knockout mice please meet Alzheimer's disease mice. So what do I mean by that? So neuroscientists can make mouse models of disease, and what they can do is they can actually put into the mouse the human disease gene the mutated gene, and sadly for the mice, but thank you mice, the mice can then end up with a human disease. And in the case of Alzheimer's mice, there are a variety of models, but in, in this case, we, uh, there are two genes that are known to cause early onset family Alzheimer's. Both of these are put into the mouse, and the mouse, uh, at about nine months of age, gets the plaques and tangles, and sadly also a serious memory loss. So what we did is we, went, we, we decided, let's see what happens if we remove Pier B. Remember, if we remove Pier B, then there's no pruning that happens. So what happens in Alzheimer's mice that don't have Pier B? And amazingly, when we studied their memory performance at nine months of age, they were protected by, uh, from memory loss in the absence of the Pier B molecule. So that actually kind of makes sense. It's rather exciting, at least to me it is. Um, so how does this happen? So again, to make another really long story short, what we discovered is this Pier B receptor is actually hijacked by the bad, this, ba this beta amyloid. And what do I mean by hijack? What I mean is that Pier B, as I said, is a receptor, which always gets everybody excited in terms of making drugs. A receptor is a protein on a cell that does work for the cell. It takes information from outside of the cell, and it actually transfers that information to inside of the cell where, the, where it can do work. And in the case of Pier B, that information is part of the pruning process. And nor there are normal ligands for Pier B, including this thing called MHC class 1. So what we think is happening is that beta amyloid is also binding to this Pier B molecule and driving pruning to excess. So the other point I want to make is that it turns out that there are actually uh, human um, uh, homologs of Pier B. There are quite a number of them. And what we discovered is that one of them called another mouthful, I'm not even going to write it out for you, it's called LILRB2. So it's very similar to Pier B. And this human homolog is also binds, it seems to be hijacked by the Pier B, by beta amyloid, and it's also present in the human forebrain. And the signaling caused by uh, binding of, of beta amyloid seems to be uh, also derailed in the same way in the human Alzheimer brain as it is in the mouse brain. Okay, so now I'm going to summarize. Okay, so what I've suggested is that Alzheimer's disease, um, which is thought to be a, uh, a problem of synapse pruning, may be driven by beta amyloid Pier B interactions, definitely worth following that up. So pruning, you know, is, there's, is accelerated in this case. and. Uh, what it also suggests to us is there might be a pill in there after all. Um, and what's great is that we could even maybe make a pill based on the fact that there's a receptor here. We know exactly what to do. And in fact, we have made a little pill and tried it out in, in mice. And so the last point I want to make is stay tuned. <laughs> so I think it's really interesting that Pier B or LILRB blockade might represent a, a slightly different therapeutic approach for treating Alzheimer's, but maybe also other pruning disorders. Now, this might be good in the sense that, I don't know if you read recently, but there was another failure of another major Lilly uh, Alzheimer disease uh, drug trial. So it's, it's really, I mean, I, I'm getting older. I would really like something soon. I want these <laughs> trials to succeed. But maybe there's a pill, but even more interesting, I think, is that, in fact, lessons from neural development may offer new treatment avenues for Alzheimer's disease and other pruning disorders. So with that, I just want to thank everyone. Thank you all. And also, I want to thank our organizers. And I have to remind everyone that this experiment was done, uh, these kinds of experiments, with many, many students and colleagues and someone. And I would also like to thank the mice. So thanks, everyone. Thank you.